Good evening and welcome to tonight's Driver's Ed class. Uh, hope you had a great day. I hope that uh, you're ready to take a look at what it takes to get out on the road. What should you know inside a vehicle with the instrument panel and some of the controls. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Make sure that you sign in so I can see who's here. Make sure that you continue to do your reading, to do your homework, hand it in. At the end of tonight's class, I'll have you text me availability. I have a few openings Saturday afternoon for people that want to uh, do some driving. And we'll schedule out Monday and Tuesday of uh, next week, too. So remember, we're shooting for twice a week. So I think hopefully by Saturday, I'll have driven with just about three quarters of you. Uh, some of you have already logged in your second drive, so kudos. Kudos to you that are staying on top of things and getting this done because it is going to move quickly. I know it doesn't seem it. I know it's a lot to ask, uh, but Driver's Ed will go, will go right along. So hold on tight. We've got a lot of material to go over. I'm going to bring down the uh, music here just a little bit. Um, we did not finish the whole section on licensing. So I'm going to basically piecemeal, I think, the uh, class on stopping and speed and, and road rage. I may even throw in some loose ends that I haven't been able to get to the last couple classes. So um, I'll try to do that. If you take a look at your outline of the course, next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about seat belts, airbags, and helmets. And I said that there's going to be a project. Uh, the project stems around a poster, a radio ad, or a video. Okay. And I think what I'm going to do is we're going to have that particular class. So there really won't be any homework over the weekend. Uh, if you have some outstanding things that you haven't sent to me, um, chapter one, um, chapter four and five, we will have a car worksheet, uh, chapter four and five. I think I have something that I can give to you with questions, uh, and that will be on the remote Facebook page. And remember, if you don't get the remote Facebook page, then you've got to text me and I will send you the copy or the link, um, uh, and a text message. Um, let's get right into what we're going to cover tonight. I actually have a video that I, the whole basis, and a lot of people ask me, I don't know if I mentioned this, a lot of people said, how in the world did you ever come up with the name Peace, Love, and Safe Driving? Why not just Oyster River Driver's Ed? Why not Toll Driving School Driver's Ed? And I said, oh, that's just kind of ordinary, kind of plain. So I wanted something that was going to have a um, you know, a little bit of meaning, okay? Because uh, I'm really into uh, safe driving and the techniques behind being a safe driver. And I was driving with a student, oh, it's got to be close to a year now uh, ago, and we had someone that was tailgating us, and they were extremely close. And the first opportunity that they got to get by us, they passed us. And... Um, I had an observer in the back, and the observer said, Mr. Toll, why in the world don't you get upset at the person that just did that to us? Aren't you upset? And I said, you know, those things happen all the time. I'm not really into revenge. I'm not into this road rage thing. I, I'm all about peace, love, and safe driving. So that is where the term came from, is that little incident when we were driving with a student, and they thought it was kind of funny. And they're the ones that said, oh, you ought to make that, you know, a YouTube channel. Uh, so that was it. And the first video that I did back, it was a year, well, a little over a year ago, 
was about getting out and, and knowing your vehicle. I think it's really important when you get to drive, especially with your parents, is that we know the gas pedal, the brake pedal, the steering wheel, but a lot of times when it comes to the actual controls of the vehicle, we assume we know where they are, we assume what they tell us, and we start moving the vehicle and we're not paying attention to them, we don't uh, really know what the information that they're giving. So we're gonna kind of take a look at that tonight. So let's kind of get right into um, tonight's class. Are you really ready to drive? What are the important steps to follow prior to moving your vehicle out on the roadway? So I want you to get out a blank piece of paper, uh, take some notes. Some of these things I've been teaching for many, many years, and actually I probably should update and, and change some of the things that I have for this PowerPoint. Because now, let me show you the first one. Know where you're going. Well, I basically did this, and I told you I've been doing this for 30 years. When I first started teaching, we didn't have GPS in a car. We didn't have GPS on a phone. So basically, know where you're going meant you better have a map or you better have a good sense of direction uh, getting around your local area. And if you did take a look at a map, and I actually put a little snapshot here of southern New Hampshire, uh, we're basically that little A pinpoint telling you um, Durham. But all around Durham are all these roadways that have numbers. And these numbers actually mean something. So what I want you to write down is that interstate systems are based on a even and odd number. An odd first number have you go north-south. An even first number has you go east-west. So that deals with the interstate. So those are those red, blue, and white signs that look like a shield. 95 is the one that most people realize. The other thing I want you to write down is that if you see a three-digit number and the two roads that we travel exclusively in driver's ed based out of Durham is 108 and 155. So what, is, what do those numbers, what does the code mean for those numbers? So an odd first number is telling you that it goes into a city. If it was an even number, like 202, I live in Rochester. So an even number is telling you it goes through or around. It could do both. 202 goes directly through Rochester, and 202 goes around the western part of Rochester. So don't be you know, fooled by the numbers. The numbers do mean something. And it's important that you have a basic sense of north, south, east, west. Most cars now do equip you with a compass and the driver's ed vehicle. And those of you that have been driving, I'll put this out to you. Where is the compass? And I want you to put it in the YouTube comments so everybody can see, okay? Where is the compass in the driver's ed vehicle, all right? I want to see how many people have actually seen it, all right? So put it in the comments. So not everyone will be able to answer this question. Um, second point, if you're out driving, yes, odd numbers on interstates go north-south. Okay, so even numbers on interstates like Interstate 80 goes east-west. Will you need to stop at other places on your way? What I'm saying here is that you don't want to waste fuel, wear and tear on your vehicle. It takes extra time. Be very judicial in what you do in a car. I know you're going to like driving. You want to get out, um, but at some point, you're going to say, I can't believe that I took the wrong route and now I'm a half hour late. I can't believe that I'm stuck in traffic and I only have a quarter of a tank left. So think about where you're traveling. Think about being um, economical in your time and economical in, in the use of your fuel. Always get directions. Okay, now that we have phones and GPS, there's no excuse. You should always 
have someone uh, helping navigate when you're when you're driving. Second thing is always do a in-house check of your physical and emotional state. We know that every day that you wake up, some days you're going to be feeling pretty good. Some days you're going to feel a little bit under the weather. What I want you to realize is that when you're not feeling well, you're probably not going to drive well. Okay. If you're upset, if you're anxious, if you're excited, it will change the way that you drive. It may make you forget to see signs. It may make you go faster. Uh, it may make you aggressive of tailgating. And the physical part that you've got to keep in mind is that any type of like muscle ache or sprain may have an effect on how you control the gas and the brake pedal. And I usually tell people that play sports, you know this, that you could have driven your car to practice and you got the crap beat out of you um, and your shoulder is just aching and you can't rotate the wheel like you normally do. So the way that it looks from the outside when you're driving, people are going, why is he making the turn so wide? Why is he not staying in his lane? Or why is he a late breaker? Well, because your foot hurts and you're not using the brake pedal at the right amount of pressure. So I just wanted you to, 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 to realize that not every day is going to be your best out driving. You're going to be less than your best. But make sure that you're not so bad that you're going to have issues out on the roadway. Okay, let's talk about weather. This is another factor. I had a few of you that drove tonight at four and five when it started to get a little bit darker and the rain started to get a little bit heavier. It does reduce our visibility. It can, not always, it can have an effect on our traction on the roadway. Um, I will tell you tonight when we drove from five to six, uh, with the darkness and the rain, it's almost like a, a double whammy, uh, you're not going to be able to see lines. So you better be pretty smart and intelligent of, of finding a way to gauge your position on the road, whether it be by using the vehicle that is in driving in front of you, their tire marks, uh, whether you're just looking at the roadway, you're cutting it in half and staying to the right half of that center mark. Uh, people do that. Whether you're looking at reflectors, and by the way, write this down in your notes. We're going to cover this when we talk about bad weather. One of the main reasons why we have reflectors on the side of the road is there will come time, uh, times when the weather is so bad you won't see lines. So those reflectors off to the side of the road will give you some um, idea of where the edge of the road is on both sides, right and left. How come nobody's mentioned where the compass? I don't see on the YouTube uh, comments where the... Um, Oh, I got to answer a question. I'm going through the comments. I'm sorry. Leah had a question. It said, for the homework, do we have to answer the review questions for each lesson or just do the questions at the end of each chapter? Uh, you don't have to do the uh, review questions. What I want you to do is to do the, the chapter questions that I put on the remote page. Okay, it's a little bit more involved than the, the test questions at the end of each chapter. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the the questions at the end of each chapter. If you do it and send it in to me, I will give you extra credit for it if you take a picture and send it um, by text. But I'm really more concerned about you doing the questions from the Facebook page, okay? Because it's usually more than 10 or 12 questions. And I think they're a little bit more difficult. Um, I got to get better at uh, reading all these comments before I get into class. So I apologize for that, Leah. Um, yeah, and the other one, Michael. Yeah, you could just contact me by text message for driving. That is that is the best. That's the best way to do it for. Someone got it right. Let me see. Someone. Addison's correct. 
Addison's got the question about where is the north-south, um, where's the compass? It's on the mirror. It's on your rearview mirror. Very good, Addison. Well, you've driven twice, so um, I'm really pleased that uh, you answered the question correctly. So good for you. So rain, fog, snow, darkness, weather will have a, um, a, an effect. Traffic conditions, too, will be uh, somewhat stressful. Uh, be smart. Only drive when you think that it is going to be um, um, advantageous for you to, to learn from the experience. So now here we're talking about traffic conditions for um, learning to drive. So I find these times to be the most stressful and the highest volume of traffic. So before school, after school, uh, normal days between 7 and 9 and 4 and 6 and on the holidays. You're always going to encounter more traffic, more people making mistakes. So if you're really stressed with driving, I would kind of stay away from, from these time, time slots. So approaching the vehicle. Okay, this is the driver's ed car. I usually park out in front of the, the school. Um, Whenever you drive a car that's been left unattended for a period of time, what you should do, and, and by the way, a lot of states are actually incorporating this into your driving test. New Hampshire's thinking about it. They haven't started yet, but I've gone to conferences where they're saying we are going towards a national standardized driving test. So we're going to basically do the same thing that they do in Indiana or the same thing that they're doing in Georgia. And what they make people do is that you've got to show that you know the vehicle inside and out. So as you approach the vehicle, you should take a look on either side. Yeah, I see what you're saying about, I got another question here coming up. Um, don't worry about the test scores on the, the chapter test because some of them basically um, aren't, graded correctly so I go through it at the end of the week so on the weekend I go through the exams to take a look and what people uh, did so at least with chapter um, the pretest, uh, you're going to have a much higher score because the survey questions at the end got got graded and they shouldn't have and I'm trying to find a way where I can ask the question but not get it graded um, and some of them you said you were right. If there is a mix-up, if you think you got a question right, but the test says it's wrong, just send me a text what question it is, and I'll go back in and take a look um, and see if the answer key got um, screwed up. Sometimes when I, uh, they give you an option to change the questions, rotate them, and sometimes when they get rotated, the um, the correct answers don't don't jive with it. So, so let me know. Um, so approaching the vehicle, make sure you go around, take a look at things like the tires, make sure that you're looking at whether there's any broken glass, any debris, any toys, um, fluids that are leaking underneath the vehicle. Make sure your license plates are still there. By the way, license plates are usually stolen, um, in parking lots. And the reason why people do that is that if you steal a car, um, why would you steal a car and keep the stolen license plate on? So you're going to probably uh, change the license plate with a different license plate so it, it goes undetected by the police. Uh, carjacking is an issue. What carjacking, write this down in your notes, is when someone tries to enter your vehicle in a parking lot uh, or a stop sign or a traffic light whenever you're stopped and the car is running. The easiest car to steal is a car that people have a key to. All right, so they're looking for you to expose the key to get into the vehicle or they're waiting for you to get into the car and then as you start to drive away, they're going to jump in the front seat, back seat and they, they take the car from you. Uh, check around for animals. Check around for small children. Every year, there are stories where people get into a car, and usually in the wintertime, they don't clear the snow off the windows or the back of the vehicle, 
and they run over pets and kids because they had no idea that they were behind them. Now, with backup cameras, it's getting, you know, less and less of these incidents, but they still they still do happen. Uh, with cats, too, they like a warm place. So don't be surprised if your car has been driven and it still has a warm engine. They like kind of getting up there on that tire there and got, they get a sense of that heat that's coming through that um, part of the engine on that side. Here's carjacking. So let me show you the video here that the newscast. Not this noon, a developing story out of Kalamazoo County. One man is dead, another arrested for the shooting and carjacking. 24 Hour News 8's Tony Taliavia is working this story. He's on the phone right now with new information. Tony? Afternoon, Emily. Investigators tell us the victim has died. He's uh, identified as a 47 year old it's man. It's very from the common Vicksburg that area. gas Police stations say he was they around hang around this morning at the and they wait for someone to get out. Augusta to when investigators say a man tried gas. to take the car he was riding in. Police tell us the suspect then tried to take another car but failed and ran away. He ran on foot. Investigators caught up to him about a half mile north of town. They were able to take him to, into custody. We talked with the Augusta police chief, who was among the law enforcement officers who, who took him into custody. He says he's glad they were able to take him in relatively soon after the shooting, but of course still sad to hear the news that the victim in this case has died. Okay, the victim died. If someone wants your car, give it up. Okay, don't be a hero. You can always replace a car. We can't replace you. Now, it also said in the article or the newscast here that they tried to take a car and they went to a different one. And I, the reason I believe, this is my own personal take on it, is that they looked and they found out that it was a manual transmission and they didn't know how to drive it, so they had to go find an automatic. And tonight we are going to talk about driving a manual transmission. Um, I think everybody should have a basic understanding of of what it takes to change, you know, change gears, drive a manual transmission. Oh, and one last thing about checking for animals and checking underneath your vehicle, checking around your car. Watch, watch this one. Let's. I think it's the next bullet. Let me get out of here for a second. Okay, let me show you this clip. This is another reason why you check underneath your vehicle, especially down in the south. Wouldn't that be something? You go to unlock your car and you get snipped or snapped at by a uh, alligator. Okay, you've already checked around the vehicle so you know it's pretty safe to, to drive. So once you get into your car, I want you to write this down because I will be testing you on this. Um, four things need to happen. Lock your doors, adjust your seat, lock your seat belt, adjust your mirrors. And it should be in that order. Now, in a parking lot, you can forget about the door locks because in this vehicle that I have for driver's ed, once you drive away, at a speeds of around five, six, seven miles per hour, it locks automatically. But I still think it's a good idea. The minute you're in a parking lot, you're in your car, you should have it locked so no one can get inside. One of the other reasons why you always want to lock your door is that in case of a crash and you don't have your seatbelt on, having your doors locked, it will keep the door from opening up. So when people get thrown from their vehicle, it's usually through an open door, although sometimes windows that are down, I'm, it's been known for people to get thrown out of windows or partially thrown out. But if it really is being really like catapulted out, then it's the door. And by having the doors locked, it's just that added sense of security that you're going to have. So lock your doors. Inside the vehicle, adjust your seat. This is not what I have for a driver's ed vehicle right now. But you do have uh, mechanisms on most cars to, to go back and forward, stuff like that. And I'm going to show you the video in a minute anyway, so I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, seat belts, everybody in the car should be uh, belted. And then adjust your mirrors. And it should be a portion of the side of your car in the corner of your mirror. And kind of 
gauge up near the back door handle. You don't want to really go um, too far down. Keep it up kind of high so when you look in your side mirrors, you can see further down the road rather than down towards the ground. And then the back window um, in the rearview mirror should be visible. Here we've got a little bit of the side corner post in the back. It's showing. And this is what it would look like uh, with seeing a part of your car in the side of your mirror. So notice that the white truck is also visible from the left side mirror. The car to the right is visible um, from the right side. Four things again is to lock the doors, um, adjust the seat, lock your seat belt, adjust your mirrors. Those are the, the things that you want to do. So with a traditional mirrors where you see the side of the car, there is an overlap. If you take a look at the dotted orange line and the solid green line, then basically, yes, Dina, you are correct. Lock doors, adjust seat, lock seat belt, adjust mirrors. You always want to do your seat belt and then do your mirrors. You don't want to do your mirrors first and then do your um, seat. Okay. And then off to the right, the dotted blue line and the solid blue line. Um, there's an overlap. So what they're trying to do now with getting students to adjust their side mirrors is where you do not have any overlap at all. Now, I don't mind if you do it this way. I'm just not a big fan of it for a new driver. I always like um, seeing the same information because it... it it reinforces that, yes, there's the car in your rear view mirror, there's the car in your side view mirror. But you can see here that we've lost all three vehicles in the side mirror. You can only see it in the rear view mirror. Both have some pros, um, but I think there's a few cons to the enhanced positioning for a new driver. I think once you get comfortable with driving, by all means, try Try this technique and see if you like it. I guess driving on a highway, this would probably be more advantageous so you um, don't have to make maybe quite as many shoulder checks when you make a lane change because you've got an overlap, or you don't have an overlap, I should say, um, and you're going to be able to see much, much better. Uh, to control your vehicle, uh, you have to know where to put the key. You have to know how to start the car. In the driver's ed car now, we do not have a key. All we have is a push button and a phobe, a key phobe. And you'll see that in the video in a little bit. We'll talk about clutch and transmission at the end of uh, tonight's class. Uh, steering wheel, I'll get to that in a moment about grabbing it and the accelerator or brake. Uh, of the three things, the steering wheel, accelerator, brake, I want you to number them in order of importance. The most important thing is your brake keeping you from where you don't want to go. Second most important item is your steering wheel. Okay, and then accelerator. So on your driver's test, they really don't care about how fast you go. I mean, you don't want to hold up traffic. I always tell people don't try to do things too quick. You want a good rhythm and tempo to your driving. So if you're slow and smooth, and, you know, within two or three miles of the speed limit, you're fine. You're good. Everybody tries to be at the speed limit or above the speed limit. And then you find yourself maybe going six, seven over. And they're going to frown upon that. So be very careful about how you use the accelerator on your driver's test. I mean, even with me, actually, I want a nice rhythm and tempo to your driving. I don't want to keep reminding you to watch your speed. Um, I do want you to know this, but I don't think that you probably have to write this down. I think most of you know what the gear selection uh, items are, but I have to go over it because I will tell you that w I had a student once that was in a parking lot, their first time out driving, and we, had an em we were in a parking lot where there was an empty parking spot in front of us. And rather than back out of the parking spot, I wanted them to pull through the empty spot to leave the parking lot. We had people walking behind us, so I figured it'd just be safer for them to pull through. Um, you can look forward. It's a lot easier. Well, 
I was looking at my notes, writing down a few things, and the car lunged backwards, and we almost hit the pedestrians that were behind us. And I looked at the driver, and I said, I wanted you to go forward. I wanted you to drive through the parking spot to leave, not reverse. And they go, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Toll. I thought the R meant, meant ride. Okay, you have to know what these letters on the gear selector mean. R does not mean ride. Okay, so let's go through these real quick. P is for park. This is the gear that you need to be in when you start the car. There's only one other gear that you can be in to start a vehicle, and that is neutral. Neutral is basically used for pushing a vehicle that is broken down, um, being towed. Um, that way the car can roll freely. But R is not for ride. It is for reverse. And we go at relatively slow speeds in reverse. We never really drive extremely fast in reverse. I doubt that we'll get over 7, 8 miles per hour in reverse. Drive is what we're mostly in. This is the forward gear. This is what we spend probably 97% of our time in. We use reverse a little bit, but reverse is just get on a parking spots and driveways. So you, most of your driving in your lifetime will always be in drive. And then below the drive position, we have low one, low two. This is a gear to get more power to the wheels in bad weather. Uh, it also helps you go slower down a hill. So using that gear effectively is beneficial. But if you never put it in these gears, you're going to be fine too by just leaving it in drive. So this is what it looks like in the driver's ed car. Okay, let's talk about the steering wheel, all right? And there's going to be a lot of debate about gripping the steering wheel. And I've noticed with some of you already that you have some strange hand positions. So let me give you my, my take on hand position. I truly believe that you have more control with both hands on the steering wheel because you never know when something bad's going to happen. And having both hands, one on the left side, one on the right side, preferably at 8 and 4, 9 and 3, 10 and 2, is that it's going to give you a better range of motion to handle something that comes out from nowhere. People that drive with one hand or in the inside of the steering wheel, grabbing the inside, um, kind of off-centered, you're going to have issues when it comes to handling emergencies. You will. It just plain out you will. Is there a law about how to grab a steering wheel? No, there's not. There are people that have physical handicaps that are driving vehicles with one hand. There are people that are quadriplegic, so they have no use of their arms, no use of their feet, that can drive specially equipped vans. They're basically, let me get out of this for a second. Well, what happened? Oh, there we go. All right. This is what they do. Okay. A person that's a quadriplegic has like a toggle switch and they take it in their mouth and they go up and down, left and right for for turning and for accelerating. I think there's also a suction part of, of what they're doing. It is insane what they can do with their head and their mouth and they can operate a vehicle. So when it comes to hand position, yeah, it's good to have both hands on the wheel, but could you still steer a, a steering wheel with one hand or one finger for a little bit down the road? Excuse me, <clears throat> down the road? Absolutely. So it is a technique it is not a law, all right? So you got that? It is a technique. It is not a law. Now, can they fail you for the way you grab your steering wheel on your driving test? They cannot. Can they fail you for making a bad turn? Yes, they can. So you could be you know, you think you're cool and you think, yeah, I'm just going to do it the way I like to do it. I don't care about the, you know, the, 
the necessary positions I learned in driver's ed. You're just going to take it upon yourself to just grab it and turn it the way you want. Go ahead, but if you make a bad turn, that's going to probably cause you to fail your test. So I would get used to it. And like we said, muscle memory, I think you've, you've started to build some habits that's going to be tough to break. I'll try to help you. I'll try to advise you. But it comes down to you wanting to do it. So grab it, 8 and 4, 9, 3, 10 and 2. I don't mind you using one hand for backing up. I almost think it's better at times. Hand over hand is where you're turning the wheel from the top, half of the steering wheel. Push pull is turning it from the bottom portion. I use both depending on where I'm driving. I do more push pull in traffic circles and parking lots, and I do hand over hand for regular driving at intersections. Now, the reason why most people don't like hand over hand, because if the airbag comes out, the hand that's crossing over the center of the steering wheel is now going to be flying right at your face when the airbag comes out. So, yeah, that would happen. Airbag is in the middle, right where the horn is, and there is a tilt position. I don't think I've had anybody use the tilt position yet. So if you want to use the tilt position, just let me know. So there's my wife. Uh, she's doing the one hand backing. Uh, here she is with both hands on the wheel. She's getting ready to make a left hand turn here. She's going to lead with her right hand over to the left. And the left hand's going to cross over and make the turn. Here she's doing push-pull. Notice the 8 and 4 position where she's going to feed the wheel back and forth from either side. Okay? So those are the three positions. Now, where should you put your foot? And I've talked to some of you that have driven this week that I'm a firm believer of keeping your heel on the floor and pivoting between the accelerator and the brake. It allows you to operate those pedals at a softer position. You know, it's going to give you more uh, finesse to your braking and your accelerating. By lifting it and pushing down, there's going to be some, some jerky movement of the vehicle, whether it be braking or accelerating. And the left foot should be over at the dead pedal. So I want you to write down dead pedal. Dead pedal is a piece of plastic that you rest your left foot on to get it away from the other pedals. But more than that, and you're going to see this in the video, is it pushes your back up against the seat. So when you make a turn too fast, it keeps you more in an upright position. So there's the dead pedal right there on the left. That's what it looks like. Now I'm going to give you some um, terms that I want you to write down. Okay. So one or two of these will probably be on the midterm. All right. So the first one is light acceleration. And you don't have to write down every single thing that's written down here. I just want you to write down light acceleration and probably what I would write down used for smooth starts and used at the beginning of turns from a stop position. Now, the bullet up above the top one is I gave an example of what kind of pressure are you talking about? It'd be like if someone soaked a sponge full of water and I said okay now step on the sponge but just barely just so we can start to see some of the water oozing out so it's very easy pressure okay you don't want anything too too hard now the next definition is progressive acceleration so this is where you're putting steady pressure on the gas pedal to get you up to the speed limit. Once you're at the speed limit, you need to know how to maintain steady pressure. Now, I think most of you know, who have driven with me, I take you through Durham, into Lee, and into Madbury on all these windy country roads. One of the reasons why I take you here is that I want to see how you use your pedals. Not only am I looking at your hands in the position on the roadway, I'm looking at, are you on the brake pedal at the right time, right amount of pressure? Are you using the accelerator to keep a good speed going up a hill and down a hill? Or are you going too slow going up and way too fast going down? Okay. The drivers that have more experience driving, I can always tell because they can keep the speed limit 
pretty much within two or three miles per hour, whether we're going up or down the hill. I mean, they're pretty spot on. There's not much fluctuation. And then there are some of you I take out driving. <laughs> I look at the speedometer. We're eight to 10 miles below the speed limit. And now we're going down the hill and now we're going eight to 10 over. So from being under to over is sometimes close to a 20 mile an hour swing. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's going to aggravate people behind you. So it's a good thing to learn how to do this acceleration with the right amount of pressure. A cover brake is when the ball of your right foot is hovering over the brake pedal. What I want you to write down for this is the word anticipation. Okay, when you think something's going to happen, you're covering the brake. This, when we talk about commentary driving, where you're pointing things out, what's happening in the road uh, in the roadway, it makes sense if you say, "Oh, the light is changing," or the pedestrian is coming from the left. Well, don't be on the gas pedal. Cover the brake. You see these things changing. You see these concerns. And of course, coasting in heavy traffic, you'll be covering the brake. Good drivers cover the brake a lot. Bad drivers don't even think about it. They just keep on driving, and then they have to brake real hard because they come too fast on top of cars that are driving in front of them. Control braking is firm, steady, even pressure on the brake pedal used in emergency situations. And uh, excuse me, non-emergency situations. So just write down normal normal braking. And when the vehicle stops, there's always going to be a pitch. Pitch means the vehicle is going forward. So let me get out of this for a second. So pitching is when your body goes forward and then it comes back. So the car pitches forward, then it comes back, comes back to a resting stop. That is a pitch. Now, the other term that I had listed there was a limousine stop. So let me say that this is the stop sign. You're coming up to the stop sign. Now, what you do with a limousine stop, you try to stop probably about 5 to 10 feet from the stop sign. So you come up to the stop sign. Just before you come to a full stop, 5 or 10 feet, you let go of the brake, and then you go the rest of the way. That's going to take a lot of the heavy pitch away. Most of us just drive right up to the stop sign, and then we stop. Most of you go over the line a little bit. By doing the limousine stop, where you try to stop about 5 or 10 feet from it, and then roll up the last bit, you're more accurate of your final placement at the line. And what they want you to do is to stop at the line. Okay, They don't want you to go a foot beyond on your first stop. Now, once you stop at the line and you've done a nice stop, a limousine stop, there's not much of a pitch. If you can't see, you've got to keep on creeping up, creeping up, creeping up. Those are our safety stops. You want to do that. But your first stop should always, ooh, should always be right at the stop sign. And then the last one is, oh no, there's two more. Trail braking is a slight decrease of pressure on the brake pedal. It's used in the following situations. The last few seconds of a limousine stop, as I just mentioned, backing up out of a driveway, out of a parking spot, inching forward in a um, heavy traffic situation, creeping or moving at a walking pace um, in downtown Dover or Durham, steady traffic, and to begin making um, a turn. Now, threshold braking, that term I want you to write down, is maximum force to the brake pedal. It's used in emergency situations. This is the little kid that's running in front of you. This is the car that stopped you didn't see. You need to stop as quickly, so you're hitting that brake pedal for all, all it's worth. Now, I want you to remember this. You cannot brake the brake pedal, all right? Think about that. You cannot brake the brake. 
Okay, mechanically, you're just not going, going to. Most cars now are equipped with something that we call ABS. ABS stands for anti-lock braking system. So when you hit the brakes as hard as you can, you still get steering and you still get maximum braking capabilities. Okay, that's important. Now, the other thing I want you to think about, and most people never thought of it this way, but have you ever thought that the brake pedal can make you go faster and the accelerator can make you go slower? Each pedal does the opposite. When you want to go faster and you're on the brake pedal, you let go of the brake pedal. When you're the accelerator and you want to go slower, you let go of the accelerator. So just remember that when I say slow down, I'm not saying brake. I could be meaning let go of the accelerator. Or go faster may not mean go to the gas pedal. It may mean let go of the brake pedal. Okay. Most people learn the brakes within like 10 minutes. Okay. Very easy. And as we said, brake is the most important pedal. Keeps you from going where you don't want to go. Um, parking brake keeps the car from rolling in parking spots. And we usually don't use the parking brake uh, in the driver's ed. Um, I just don't see a need for it because we're usually parked on level ground. But if your parents are the type that always wants you to set the parking brake, by all means, listen to your parents and learn how to use it. I'm not going to go through the gauges. I'm going to go through this bullet real quick here. Because I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get the, uh, the video up on what I did so you can see things here. Yeah. Oh, we went too far. That's part of your homework. Um, let me get to if this works here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the video. So um, I want you to put in the YouTube, someone in the YouTube comment section, can you see the YouTube video right now? Someone put yes or no before I start the video because I this video was going to be too much to download. So I wanted to just show it right from my screen. So someone let me know whether you can see this on your phone or your screen. Okay, you can see it. All right. So I'm going to play a portion of this. I'm going to try to get it to the point where it's talking about the gauges, okay? In my local area. So I'm going to move it ahead just a little bit. So here's the uh, getting into the vehicle. I'm going to get out of that just a little bit. Uh, let's go right here. And then do the right. Make sure that it's adjusted okay, just so right. This is the four things you also do in the notice car. In this side lock the doors. That we have a blind spot um, mirror. This adjust is your a, seat. Uh, convex lock your seat belt. Adjust your mirror. So you right now we're talking about the wider mirrors. angle. Some cars actually give you a blind spot monitor where it will actually a flash a light indicating that someone is entering the blind spot area. So once you've gotten everything adjusted then you can basically take a look at your instrument panel. To start a vehicle that doesn't have a key, one of the things that you have to make sure that you have on your person is something called a phobe. And that phobe allows you just to hit this power button and the car starts right up. If you take a look at the instrument panel, lights will come on and then turn off as the computer checks each item to make sure that it's in running condition. Now the thing to remember about lights on the instrument panel, yellow lights tell you things are activated. Red lights indicate that it needs your attention. Okay, make sure you write that down. Red lights mean it needs your attention. Yellow lights you take a look at the things are activated. dash. So you have the multiple speedometer colors on the instrument the panel. Dial off each to one the right. needs something. Notice that the seatbelt light is on. 
there's a passenger in the vehicle without a seat belt so make sure that all your passengers have their seat belt locked notice the seat belt light is now off has been clicked the ready light that's yellow is an indicator that the car is on if you listen carefully you can't hear anything but just the air conditioning this is a Camry Toyota Camry hybrid which is extremely quiet this is why you have to take a look at your instrument panel to make sure that your car can be put into gear to move because if that ready lights not on you're not going anywhere if you look at the dial off to the left because it is a hybrid it has a whole bunch of information about that hybrid technology not too important for someone that's just learning to drive but someone that's trying to squeeze out every little bit of miles per gallon out of the gas they're going to be paying attention to that dial way over to the left your fuel gauge is at the bottom of your speedometer always try to keep your car at least half full I always recommend my students to let me know when it's below half it's not their responsibility to pay for gas but it is their responsibility to make sure that we have enough fuel to do what we need to do so we are definitely all set with fuel if you take just a look to the very bottom of that gas gauge dial there is a symbol of a gas pump with an arrow that is indicating which side that you need to bring your vehicle over to in order to pump gas if you pull to the opposite side you're gonna have to put that hose over the top of the vehicle or over the hood or over the trunk not a very good idea you're gonna kinda look a little bit foolish doing that now probably the most important thing with this instrument panel and remember every instrument panel will be slightly different so look at your owner's manual make sure that you know all your dials your gauges all your lights and what they indicate in this Toyota Camry we also have a speedometer right smack dab in the middle it is digital very easy to know what speed you're going when you're looking at a number rather than looking at the dial trying okay, to guess whether it's five activated. ten whatever it is really hard to do when you're learning to drive because your focus should always be on the road so a quick look down at the speedometer see the number that you're trying to aim for what the speed limit is and then uh, look back up at the road it's also important to see that there is a distance to empty so we get to go 498 miles on the remainder of the gas that we have in this vehicle we have an outside temperature gauge telling us to press the brake pedal and go over to the gear shift the shift depending on what gear that you put it in it will be indicated right there in the middle for you you also have a odometer which will also act as a tripometer if you were to press a button and this computer screen can change according to what you want to find out about the vehicle this is actually telling you that we are going southeast at the time if we press it again the radio is off if we press it again it could be linked up to your text messages we go back to settings we're back at the first gauge and this will also give us multiple subcategories that we could actually go through telling us what we're averaging for miles per gallon on fuel economy there's your tripometer if you want to gauge how far you've been on a trip this is telling you how the hybrid battery is working at the time and tire pressure which is also very very helpful but the thing to remember about the tire pressure uh, gauge inside of a vehicle it is a r rough estimate of what you have for tire pressure I always keep on my vehicle a separate gauge that I can actually go outside put onto the tire stem and get an accurate reading these are a little bit more accurate than the pencil type gauges that you have although it's better to have something like that than nothing at all so I always keep that in my vehicle so let's go through the rest of the car with a quick rundown let's take a look at the directionals if you take a look at the directional 
If you take a look at the directional, up is right, you can see the light flashing, down is left. In all the years that I've been teaching, there has not been a class where I haven't had a couple students that do not know their left and their right. They don't even know what to do with the directional lever. To go left, do I go up, do I go down? They're very confused, they're very nervous when they start to drive. One of the easiest ways that I've been able to teach left and right is that I have them open up their fingers and as they turn the wheel in the direction that they want to go, it is indicating with the tail light which direction we're going. Very easy to remember right and left. So here's a left. Put your fingers open as you're grabbing the wheel. Go down. Directional li uh, light is on, indicating that we are going to the left. After a while, they'll be able to do that, and then they just flick it with their fingers and not have to worry about what to do. But put it between the two fingers. Pretty, pretty helpful for someone that's been struggling. If you take a look at the directional lever, we also have a couple settings for our lights. I always recommend driving with your lights on auto. So as it gets darker, uh, they will come automatically. It also gives you a low voltage light during the day. So when it's foggy, um, kind of overcast, your car will stick out. When people look in their rear view mirrors, they'll be able to see your car. Up from there is your parking lights. And we'll talk more about that later. But parking lights are not to be used when you're moving. It's when the car is in parked and not moving. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Low beams all the way up. Indicator that you've got full use of your low beam. If you take your directional lever and push it forward, notice the blue light that comes on, indicating that your high beam is on. So if you push it forward to activate the high beam, bring the lever back towards you to turn it off. Not every car has it in this sequence. Once again, look at your owner's manual. Know what your car has. Your first driving lesson with your parents or with a friend, whoever, should be in a parking lot getting used to the controls because you do not want to be driving searching for levers, searching for buttons, searching for gauges when something is going wrong. Your focus has to be on driving. It has to be on the position, your speed interacting with other cars and pedestrians. The minute you take your eyes off the road and start focusing where your windshield wipers are or how to turn off your high beams, you are not gonna stay in your lane. You are going out of your center position on the roadway and now you are becoming dangerous. Um, cars are now equipped with info centers. So most of the buttons here in the middle will be for like your radio, uh, for Bluetooth, things like that, up, uh, hanging up your phone, um, different modes that you have on your info center, which is right there. Now remember, your info center will also be on most cars now. Your backup camera. And your backup camera should be another aid to help you in reverse. Do not entirely go by what you see in your backup camera because it does have a limited amount of view. So you're still going to have to look in your side view mirrors, rear view mirror, and then possibly turning your head in any direction that you're going to go. Let's take a look at the lever over here to the right of the steering wheel. This is your windshield wiper on a Toyota and you basically have a few positions. You can see right here we are in the off position so if we were to go down from the off position we're going to go into intermittent. And then your intermittent also has a dial that allows you to change the speed. Then you have low and then you have high.
you take a look at the center of your console, you basically have your hazard lights, emergency flashes, whatever you want to call them. You've got your temperature. Now in this car we have dual temperature so you can change uh, according to what you want to have for the vehicle. This will con control the fan. You have your front defroster. You have your rear defroster. You have the mode where the air is being circulated. Also notice that the uh, defroster comes up. And then air circulation over here. And then your air. Now this is the beginning of August, so it is a little bit warm. So the air is on as we drive most days. But the thing to remember about your defroster is that when you have your defrosters on in the winter time, because people will be getting into the vehicle, they may be warm, especially um, students. They may have just come from um, a class or from a sporting event, and moisture is going to be inside the vehicle. It would be a good idea to put your car uh, in the uh, defroster mode with the air conditioning on to, uh, to get a lot of the moisture outside of the vehicle. You don't want to keep it inside the vehicle. You want to get out of it or else your windows are going to steam up a little bit. Uh, we mentioned the gear selector. On the gear selector, you've got to remember your foot needs to be on the brake. Kind of hard to see in the position that I'm in right now. Um, the pedal just in the middle that's got a horizontal position is your brake. Um, the pedal to the far right, of course, is your gas or accelerator pedal. And you should be able to pivot your foot uh, between the two pedals when you drive. It is not illegal to brake with your left foot and drive or accelerate with your right foot. It's not recommended for a new driver because they could be confused on what foot is on what pedal and both feet will actually go down. So I always recommend heel on the floor, pivot between the two pedals. If you make a mistake then you can go over to the other pedal. But foot must be on the brake, must be depressed for you to put it in the gear that you want. Now you must follow the diagram all the way over to the right and down to get into reverse. Then you have neutral, drive, and then B, which is a lower gear. On some cars, you may have one or two. You may have SRL. These are lower gears that will provide more torque to your vehicle to get up a hill and bad weather or if you're towing something. Uh, it does provide some braking force uh, to your vehicle. Uh, also remember that the only two uh, gears that you can start your vehicle in is neutral and park. Uh, if you have any engine problems, can get the gear uh, selector out, maybe putting in a neutral and starting up, uh, that will get you going. In this particular vehicle, we have seat warmers. So we have that down here. So make sure you don't accidentally have that on in the middle of summer. You're going to put someone into a hot seat. It won't be too comfortable when they drive. Um, back to the info center here. Uh, the thing I want to point out is that every car is going to be set up for the owner of the vehicle. So when I get a student in the vehicle, very important to under, let them understand that this is for backing up. We're going to use the backup camera. If we ever do listen to music, it will always just be on a station um, really, really at a very low, low volume. But not to mess around when you're learning to drive with um, the instrument info center here. Uh, it gets to be very distracting, so not a good good thing to do in a car that's that's moving. So let's just turn this off here, power this off. That's good. Um, parking brake on some cars are between the bucket seats, but in this particular vehicle it's down far left underneath the instrument panel take your left foot push down on that parking brake and then push down to deactivate it uh, just below that you can see uh, over here is a piece of plastic right here is what we call a dead pedal 
in this dead pedal, you push your left foot like I am right now, is this provides, if you take a look what I'm doing with my back, notice that when I'm pressing on my left foot, my back goes against the back of my seat. And that's allowing me to, to stay upright. Think about this, if you're going, if you keep your left foot, see how a lot of people may keep their left foot underneath their right foot? If you take a look, if I'm making a turn right now, notice what my upper body is doing. It's leaning. So in case of a crash, the airbag is only protecting your shoulder and not your upper body. Pressing on your left foot presses your back up against the seat and allows the airbag to do what it's meant to do, is to protect all your vital organs between your shoulder blade and your belly button. So don't put that foot underneath. Don't lean into your turns. Stay upright in your driving. Now, while we're here talking about position, be extremely careful about people that want to get extremely close to the steering wheel. When you have your elbows pinned up against your body, it doesn't allow full rotation of the steering wheel. It doesn't allow the airbag to come out correctly and you're going to do some internal damage to your upper body and to your face. This is way too close to a steering wheel. Now when you go back, a lot of males think that they're at home in their easy chair. And they want to drive like this. One hand, a lot of times, if they've had some experience with driving and they have basic controls of a car, they think driving is more comfortable this way. Same problem as being too close. It doesn't allow you to have the right hand position or to allow you to turn the wheel in a manner to handle most emergencies. Could you drive straight down the road like this? Absolutely but you put a child that's coming out in front of you, an animal, you're, you're too relaxed, you're too relaxed. So as we said earlier, what you wanna make sure that you're doing is allowing yourself to have your wrist at the top of the steering wheel. So when you drop down 10 and two, nine and three, eight and four, then you're in the best position. If you take a look at someone drive, most people will find a position that's good for them. It may be a little bit off center, like one o'clock and eight o'clock, or 10 o'clock and three o'clock, but they still have contact, both hands on the wheel. The thing to remember, there are no laws, as far as I know, in any state that says that you have to have both hands on the wheel. This is a technique. This is about safety. This is controlling the vehicle. Could you drive with one finger? Could you drive with your knees? Maybe your dad, used to tell you, oh yeah, I used to drive, I used to drive with my knees. Of course, the steering wheel is moving. As long as the wheel is moving, the car is moving with the steering wheel. So how you do that doesn't really matter as long as you have complete control of the vehicle. Now, a lot of people say, do not turn a wheel from the top because now with the technology with airbags, the airbags will be coming out at your arm and your arm will be coming out at you. I do understand that, I do believe that. But I don't believe that in an emergency that push-pull where most people are turning the wheel from the bottom at uh, 8 and 4 o'clock and pushing and sliding the wheel is going to allow you to make that full turn. If you take a look at a steering wheel with both hands on the wheel, you could basically go on a face of a clock from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock with one fluid motion. Same thing from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock very quickly. When you do push-pull, Push-pull only allows you to go six inches at a time. Takes too long in an emergency. So I'm still a firm believer at higher speeds, you're going hand over hand. In a parking lot like we're in right now, you're gonna probably go into a parking space because of slow speed with a push-pull, be more relaxed at a, at a lower speed. One of the things we mentioned earlier was your tire pressure that you can check it on the uh, one of the different modes inside the vehicle indicating 
what you have for tire pressure and how to use a gauge on the tire stem. Now all tires on the tire wall will indicate the maximum pressure that you put into a tire. But the best way to do this, if you come around the corner here and take a look, right on the door jam will give you an indicator of what you have for tire size and also what's recommended for tire pressure. Notice it says 35 and I believe what we had on the um, indicator in the vehicle we were right between 34 and 36. The other thing that I want to point out on the tire on the door jam right here is your VIN number. Your VIN number is like your social security number that you have that identifies you. It's very particular to you. A car uses a VIN number, vehicle identification number. It's located here on the door and if you come around to the front we can see it located right here in the front window. This also will be indicated on your registration. That way, if your vehicle ever has a recall, how do they send out all the information to Toyota owners that you have a brake problem? They take a look through a computer system and they run VIN numbers through the state system and send out notices to people that their car has a current recall. So it's important to know this. You can actually go to a website, and I'll list this up above, where you can go, put in your VIN number, and it will indicate what type of recalls that your car may have had. This is helpful when you go to buy a vehicle. I'd use Carfax. That's also a helpful way to find out if there's been any type of recalls. But you can also just do this. Um, I think it's safercar.gov. And uh, you put in a VIN number and model year, and it'll give you all the information about recalls. So these are just a few helpful tips to get you out on the road going for your first drive. Okay, that basically is a rundown of knowing knowing your vehicle. I'm going to try to get out of here now. I don't know. How do I get back to the entire screen? Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Oh, there it is. Okay. Here we are. Let's get back to where we were before. Um, so hopefully that was somewhat helpful. Um, what I'd like to do, you, I want you to write down safercar.gov. Part of what I want you to do for your homework uh, this weekend is how safe is your vehicle? What is the crash rating? And you don't have to use safercar.gov. You could just Google uh, crash ratings. I want you to have a an idea of how safe your vehicle is. And what you may want to do is compare it to a vehicle that you would love to own one day. Like if you wanted a Corvette or you wanted a pickup truck or a Jeep, I want you to research, do your car and compare it to the car that you want to drive. Let's see which car is, is safer. All right. Now, most cars now are getting fairly decent ratings, like a four star, five star. I'd be surprised if anybody had a three. If, if you find your car has a three car rating, you're going to be on the bottom half, okay? Um, and what I want you to realize is that your car insurance is somewhat based upon these ratings. So if you're ever looking at finding uh, cheap insurance, get a car that is safe because you're going to get rewarded because it's going to protect you and your passengers. Um, oh, they talked about the instrument panel. I, I talked about the instrument panel. Let me get, where is it? This is going to be part of your homework right here. This worksheet I will put on the remote Facebook page. Um, if you can't get it on the remote Facebook page, then you can either come back um, to YouTube. 
because every class that we have is being recorded. And you can go to this slide and just freeze it. And just write down. All I want you to do is to get a blank piece of paper and put down A, I think this is what this means. B, this is what I think this means. If you get a couple blanks, I don't care. All right? So I have two banks. This is a bank of symbols and controls you should know. And this is the second bank of symbols that you should know. Like I said, I am not looking for you to do this um, as a test. If you wanted to go online, get your owner's manual from a vehicle that's in your driveway. A lot of cars use the same type of symbols. That may help you. I want you to be familiar with what's going on in your car. Now think about it. The vehicle that your parents are going to let you drive cost money. All right. If it's not maintained, if you're driving it and there's something that's indicating you should not be driving it as a, as in a warning light, like an oil pressure light, you're going to ruin the car. You're going to do thousands of dollars of damage. What we're trying to prevent here is you getting in serious trouble. That's what we want to accomplish here. So, and I think it was um, Adina that brought up the question because she was confused about the lights. Your lights are communicating to you. Your gauges are communicating to you. Look at them. Understand them. Yellow means something is activated. Something is on, like headlights. If you find a yellow light or... Um, if you find a red light, that means it needs your immediate attention. You may not, you know, you shouldn't be driving. Like the seatbelt light is pretty important. They want to make sure everybody's safe. But could you drive down the road without a seatbelt on? Yeah, but it's going to continue to stay on red and it's going to stop making a noise, the beeping noise. So uh, red needs your immediate attention. Now the green light that you saw in the driver's ed car dealt with the hybrid. It just means that you're... Um, you're using some technology around the hybrid battery. So be familiar with the colors. You're usually going to see green, red, and yellow. Okay, so we got this bank and we got this bank. Okay, those two. So I'm going to put that on the Facebook page in a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about driving a manual transmission. Most cars, as we said last night, built in the 40s and 50s were manual transmission. Once we started to find more people out on the road um, and trying to teach people how to drive quickly, and it's much easier to teach someone on automatic than a manual transmission. You're going to get up onto the, uh, on the road a lot quicker and be a better driver on an automatic than you'll ever be on a transmi uh, manual transmission at the beginning of your drive, learning to drive. So once we started to get more... Um, young people owning vehicles, um, then we started to see a change. When we find that we had more moms and dads working and moms weren't staying home, um, we had to buy other cars, um, a second or third car. Everybody wanted something really quick, easy to drive, go with the automatic, a lot, lot, lot safer. There's not as many crashes, but it is a lot of fun to drive a manual transmission. So let's talk about some of the, the things that you should know. Uh, first thing, there are three items on a manual transmission, clutch, stick shift, and accelerator that has to be used in combination with one another. It really is a like playing a musical instrument. That's the closest thing that I can think of is that you have to know how to press down certain levers and, and keys on a musical instrument to make it sound right. Well, you have to use the clutch, the stick shift, and the accelerator in a manual transmission the right amount at the right time for it to drive well. If not, you're going to stall. It's going to be uncomfortable. Um, you're going to look foolish out on the roadway. So that is the movement of the vehicle. So let's talk about the clutch. The clutch is the third pedal that's underneath the dash. So it's just to the left of the brake pedal. And when we talk about fully depressed, we're meaning disengaging or breaking the connection between the engine and the transmission. That way you're not going to stall. 
when you press down on a on a clutch pedal all the way to the floor the car can't stall it will it'll will still be on if you let go of the clutch pedal too quickly you will stall so it has to be halfway between all the way down and all the way up so that halfway point is what we call the friction point that's where you're holding the clutch uh, in order for you to move the vehicle to the next gear. So when we talk about gears, and I guess the easiest way to explain it would be like first gear would be like from 0 to 10, 15 miles per hour. Second gear would be around 15 to 25 miles per hour. Third, um, 35, 45. Fourth, 45, 55. And then five would be 55 or 60 or above. So when you want to drive in those particular speeds, you have to make sure that you are in that gear in order to accomplish that. You, like you can't be trying to go 50 in second gear. It just it just won't happen. Same thing, you can't be going 15 miles per hour in fourth gear. That's just not going to happen. It's going to be a very rough ride. So the hard part is, okay, you got to work those numbers up, shift up or shift down according to is your speed going up or is your speed going down, okay? It's much more of a thinking a person's car. That's why automatics, you don't have to think about it. You just hit the gas pedal, the car moves forward. Okay, friction point I do want you to know, that's the point where the engine and transmission is now engaged. The car will start to move. And when a car starts to move in first gear, you're going to feel the car wanting to go forward. You're going to hear the engine start to make a different type of a, a sound. And the easiest way to practice is doing everything in reverse, meaning going from first to second. Well, you can't go to first to second in reverse. I take that back. Uh, going backwards or finding the friction point is what you're trying to do in, in reverse. Much more difficult to find the friction point in first. That's what I meant to say. The parking brake or emergency brake is what you want to learn um, how to use. I think there's an echo. Let me get out of this. Okay. Use the emergency brake when starting on a hill. That's going to prevent you from rolling backwards. Okay. Because when you have the clutch pedal pushed all the way down and you let go of the brake pedal, the car is going to, to move backwards. So by having the parking brake or the emergency brake, the car won't roll back. But the minute you feel the car moving forward, you're going to have to push down a little bit more on the gas pedal, let off on the, on the uh, clutch pedal a little bit, and the car will now start to move. And you're going to drop the... Drop the emergency brake. These are the gears. Don't need to have to write these down. I already mentioned them, so you don't really need to know that. Downshifting, I do want you to write down. That is when you need to get power up a hill. So that means that if you're in fourth gear and you're approaching uh, the bottom of a hill, you should probably go right into third. That's going to give you more pulling power to get up the hill. Same thing when you go on the back side of the hill and start going down. You don't want to be on the brake the whole time because you're going too fast now. You may want to go from fourth gear to third going down a hill because once you go into third, it's a lower gear. It's going to act like a braking force, and it's a little easier to control your speed that way. Um, I'm not going to show the video uh, because it's a little bit longer than I think it's about 12 minutes long and I don't want to uh, go that long tonight I want to talk about um, the homework um, chapter 4 as I said will be on later tonight on the remote Facebook page uh, I'll have those two worksheets posted also and I believe I don't know if this can go on. No, maybe not. Let me unlock. I have a hard time bringing things over. Huh. I've got it right here on my computer screen, but it's not letting me bring it on. I don't know why. Well, anyways, um, I wish I had it up. 
I'm going to see if I can find it. I cannot find it on my... on my screen. Well, let me explain it. Part of your homework is going to do some research on the vehicle that you're driving. I want you to go outside uh, this weekend, get into the glove compartment of the vehicle that you're going to be driving at home mostly. And I want you to complete this worksheet that deals with what type of gasoline is recommended for your vehicle. What type of oil, okay? should you put in, in use for your vehicle? What size tire is on your car? Um, what light bulbs are being used? Now, you should have basic understanding of your vehicle. And this is what I want you to understand. Anything like a light bulb, you should be able to replace. I mean, if the light up above went out, okay, we know how to change a light bulb in a house. You should know how to change a light bulb in a car. Because if you don't, and you take it to a mechanic, they're going to charge you $60 an hour to replace a light bulb. Now, it's not going to take them a whole hour, but it could take them, they'll charge you 15 minutes worth of labor, and that's $15. And the light bulb may be $5, $10. To change a light bulb on your car could cost you $25, 30 bucks. You could save yourself the money of the labor charge by you doing it. I don't expect you to do an oil change, but I do expect you to know if you have low oil in your vehicle, and we'll talk more about how to check the oil, but you should know that if it's low oil, you've got to put some in. So when you go to the gas station and they're selling oil, you better know what type to put in your vehicle. You don't want to ruin your engine. So there are some items that I want you just to go around your vehicle, ask your dad, if you've got a brother uh, who's a mechanic or something, remember, you don't have to do this all alone. I want you to get some help and some information from people. So we've got uh, chapter four and five. I think there's questions. Um, we have the worksheet for the car, and then we have the warning lights. So that is basically what is, what is due for Tuesday. I do want to drive with some of you on Saturday. I have some openings, so please text me if you want to drive on Saturday. If you want to drive on Monday or Tuesday, um, if you don't have a manual, you can just Google it. You could get, I could get a bring a manual. I could Google right now, like I showed you the YouTube video. I could go right now and bring him bring up a manual. So no one should have an excuse they can't get a manual. So. Everybody has use of their phone or uh, laptop, so you should Google it if you don't want to go outside or ask for it or can't find it, so there's no excuse. Um, but I think, oh, drive times, Monday, Tuesday. So please text me, let me know um, what your availability is, and we'll try to squeeze you in at the beginning of this week. And then Tuesday night's class, we'll take a look at Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I only like scheduling three or four days ahead of time. If I do more than a week, people tend to forget unless we uh, have a hard drive time. If you want a hard drive time, like every Tuesday, Friday, I think I'm talking to, um, I forgot who, um, let's see, I told um, Leah that we're probably going to drive Tuesdays, Fridays. So we're kind of locking down a drive time. I don't mind doing that, but uh, we got to agree upon that. So that kind of takes care of this week, uh, getting to know the vehicle, what you're getting into with licensing knowing about the roadway systems and how they're built and how we're regulating them. So we covered a lot of information this week. Next week, we get into uh, airbags, seatbelts, helmets. We're talking about turning, communication, and vision. And then on uh, Thursday's class, one of my favorite, on sign sil signals and pavement markings, where we talk about signs and all the different stuff that's going out on the road. That's the fun class where we really kind of make sense of all, all this information that's being thrown at us. Uh, which is um, a good good topic. So I hope to have a good discussion, even though it's here online. So I appreciate you tuning in tonight. And uh, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, do your work, and we'll stay on top of things, and we'll get this program done on time. So have a good night. We will see you if you're scheduled to drive. If not, let's schedule drive time. Have a good night.